Hey everybody, welcome to the Hit or Die podcast, episode 42. We're here with Boston Red Sox scout Josh Labandera, uh, hometown boy. Um, finally live, face-to-face. Uh, he uh, was at home last time, but uh, uh, it's great having you on the show again, Lab. Right on, man. Just pumped up to be in the the room, dude. The, the room. <laughs> you keep seeing um, it. Uh. Yeah, I keep seeing it when I when I scroll through and, and uh, pop your guys' podcast in and some of the some of the studs you guys have had on here. So it's nice to be sitting where some of them have been. Seventy nine fastballs. I mean, I could be I could be wrong because we've been shut out three games in a row. But <laughs> um, maybe there's a little lack of adjustment. <laughs> There he's just pinpoint. Well, I don't know. What's, the what's hardest it? fastball to hit is a good located fastball. Yeah, I was just gonna say, what's the best pitch in fastball? You know, well located, or what's the best pitch in baseball? It's yeah. a well located fastball. Um, and, and you know, if you watch this kid pitch, that's what he is, man. Yeah. Fastball command, uh, both sides of the plate. And uh, to his credit, he's got some deception. You know, it's a longer levered guy. You know, ball's getting out there a little bit. And uh, you know, I don't know how how the ball. You know, not one to talk about technology, but uh, from the pitching side, I think you know that that spin data is interesting. Um, it, it, it explains why he gets swings and misses, uh, which, you know, a normal radar gun necessarily see, dude, you look at it, you're like, man, it's 86. And then you go back and look at it and the guy might have some, you know, ridiculous spin rate of 2,600 or 2,500 or whatnot, um, or whatever it may be. Uh, and you just go with that and now he projects, he puts on more strength. Hey, maybe, maybe you got something here, but, um, uh, the now stuff's kind of. What, what tells the tale, I guess. And you brought up the draft and follow. What 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 was that? Not, why is it not a thing anymore? I'm um, just because I don't know. I'm no. I'm, I actually agree. I wish it. I wish there's still. I've heard be, people talk. Like even Andy's the JUCO game that. would be a lot stronger. Hundred uh, percent. I think that's really affected the junior college. Uh, uh, their ability to get those kind of guys um, that have upside to come in that that improves it actually it, it improves the the, the play. Uh, you look at programs, uh, the history of programs, Sac City, I mean, they used to have tons and tons of drafts, year in, year out. River, uh, Riverside was a powerhouse. Yeah, Riverside, uh, Santa Ana, <laughs> um, in Northern California, Fresno City had guys year in, year out. You know, COS. But COS, Merced, uh, you know, Laney. She mm-hmm. used to look oh, at yeah. Laney, man. Laney had tons of, of those dudes that were just athletes that maybe weren't as refined, you know, and, and that's... Their, their tool set that they have the tools that you know there's no doubt about it but they just aren't as refined as those kids that are ready to go play at, at division ones and higher levels uh to where you know the whole junior college scheme has changed man it, it's really been hit hard and it's unfortunate those guys used to get to play game after game in the fall i mean dude we would play i wanted to say you know we play tuesday thursday doubleheader saturday doubleheader sunday so you, you're getting six games a week uh you know, traveling, home games, you know, double dip at Santa, you know, Santa Barbara, come back, go to Cuesta. So you were getting spread around, not just playing the local guys, but you were kind of expanding, you know, especially in the fall, um, just playing the games and, and getting the reps. Uh, and then that's what it's about. And I think junior college, you know, what do they get, 10 contacts now? Yeah, it's, um, it's down to even when I played. Yeah, it's <clears> just, <throat> it, it, it's no draft and follow has affected the game at that level in, in more ways than one uh, I, I would have to say it's funny they regulate the contacts for high school and all that and yet you I mean this travel ball kids were playing up until December there was travel ball going I mean it didn't stop like three weeks ago yeah you know we're worried about pitch count in arms and yet you've got a, a roster of 13 or 14 kids that play six games in two days yeah and arms go and no ice and no running and no conditioning and uh it just gets mishandled and and um, i won't say all of them i don't want to throw all of them lump them into majority yeah but there's a majority yeah majority i see a lot of it mis mishandled oh yeah and i've been there i've coached it way when i first started i did travel and i was like dang this is borderline dangerous well especially when all they care about is winning they don't care about the kid itself Right. It, it, I'm kind of, I'm not, I wouldn't say I deal with it. Yeah. You know, I see it right now with, with my son. He's, he's not even nine, you know, and we're, we're doing some tournaments and stuff. And uh, just this, the emphasis of winning, like, oh, we have to win. We have to win. We're, you know, we're, we're this, this team everybody wants to play on. And man, at the end of the day, it's about developing. Uh, it's about teaching kids at that age, eight, nine, teach hitters how to hit the ball hard, square the ball up, hit the ball hard. That should be their goal every at bat, whether you get on or get, don't get on. Hit the ball hard, square it up, um, hustle on and off the field, run balls out, know 
know where to throw the baseball. You know, the basic fundamentals of the game, you know, where the the base the base of the, the, the whole building, you need to build that thing up and you get to the top. I mean, man, we're jumping up and going to the elevator, you know, floor 10 with these kids. It's talking to them like they've been playing for five, six years. And you have to teach these little dudes everything. And it's a process, man. And it's patience. And, um, you know, hopefully... Hopefully I have the right temperament, you know, with my guy. But, dude, I'm not going to, you know, live or die over a weekend tourney in, in Mendota if we don't win uh, over, you know, 16 teams or whatever. It's about development and uh, just teaching my son how to play the game right. And that's what we should be, te- you know, teaching all these guys at that age. Well, how many, uh, besides you, but you're there for your son, how many uh, professional scouts are at that nine-year-old travel ball game? Zero. Oh, okay. Uh, zero. Uh, I didn't know zero were... college recruiters. <laughs> Um, IMG's not there recruiting, uh, Boris, I didn't see anybody with Boris there either. Uh, so, you know, there's not a lot of scullies being handed out at eight, nine, 10, 11 year old. Uh, they still got to go to high school and, and get past the challenges of high school that, that aren't just, you know, competition. It's the outside, uh, influences that start playing a, playing a, uh, a factor. Um, you know, they play for these travel guys year in, year out. They're doing these tournaments here and there and, uh, it's how good they are, how good they are. Oh, they're hitting 400, 450. Well, I go out and watch high school and they're not hitting 250. So, um, and supposedly they're facing this great and better, bigger competition. I, I just don't see it. I scout a lot of these tournaments and it's, yeah, there are some good teams. Don't get me wrong. Uh, there are some teams that, that are stacked that, that do have some prospects, but the majority of them are not. They're, they're not, and it's not that good. It doesn't matter what, what they're wearing. I don't care what jersey. I don't care if it says anything. It could be any brand, any logo, any any team that's a special team. Like It's about how good the player is at the end of the day, and that's what the college coaches are recruiting. Um, and, and those guys can preach and, and, and talk to their blue in the face about how good they, their players are and how they develop and, and this and that. But at the end of the day, it's going to boil down to how good the kid is. Uh, and, and, you know, you're selling your product, but you hope that product stands up to what you've been preaching. Um, so it, it's, it's a, it's a funky industry. There's a lot of money involved. Um, way too much money in my opinion. Well, maybe that's way part of where the, the wanting to win comes from too. Well, you know, how can we're you investing dollars? We better, you know, we need to win, but how can you actually say you develop players because you're with them for games? Yep. And maybe one, maybe one or two days a week. Yep. May, maybe you get these kids to, you know, if it's these big, there's a lot of big name uh, places that, that claim they develop. You know, I don't understand. I hit with a lot of kids that play for these organizations. They're not in the cages flipping to them. Uh, I don't see them hitting them fungo to them out on the weekends at, at their high school ballparks. I see high school coaches doing it. I, I see them developing during high school practice at game, at, at their practices when they're getting ground balls and doing repetitions. But I never see travel ball guys hitting actual, having workouts. Hey, we're having an infill workout or, hey, we're having a a hitter's little camp. You know, some might do. um, And and there might be some that that hold them on the weekends. I'm sure there are. Uh, But to say that you're a development program, that's a little far-fetched for me. Um, Just call it what it is. It's travel ball, period. Travel ball. Um, You know, there's no way to sugarcoat it. It's travel ball, period. Well, and you got guys that period flip, right? <laughs> period. How many period. Yeah. See, guys flip <laughs> teams, ball. right? It, they don't all stay on one program. Uh, we, you know, we're not playing enough here. We're going to no. take our money elsewhere. And everybody wants to take credit for somebody. You know, you get oh, yeah. one kid that's played for three different teams. Now he's now all of a sudden three different programs have developed him. That makes zero sense to me. I mean, it, yeah, you got to put your everybody's trying to put their stamp and label on everybody. You know, they never re-pull their tweet after a guy goes off and, and, and struggles at the D1 and kicks back. You know what I mean? <laughs> They're all in prior to, uh, but after after the fact, you know, where, where are they at? So you just got to be careful and, and just know what you're getting into from a – from a if and, hey, I'm not saying that's the wrong route. You don't do it. There are some events you go to, you know, um, that, that there is colleges. You have to go during the right windows. Uh, attending a tournament in Arizona when not a – any college school can go to is pointless. It's pointless. The money you're paying uh, for all this so-called exposure and experience, save it. 
focus on your high school season. It's January 15th, man. You guys are getting ready to go. You can't Everybody's... even be recruited at that time. Exactly. Yeah, that's we're talking about the window. You we've, know? And, yeah, we've talked about that. Know, recruiting calendar. know the calendar. Go like, help your high school program get better. Go go, go help your team win a Valley title, hopefully. you know. Uh, focus on your high school season. I, I'm still waiting for them to announce what travel team a guy plays for when he goes to the big leagues on TV. I never hear it. They always tell you what high school he went to and what former players went there. Um, but they never talk, oh, this guy played for uh, such and such travel organization. They don't, it, it, it's point. It doesn't matter. Uh, they talk about your high school. Be proud of what high school and city you're from. I mean, at least that's how I grew up. We didn't have travel ball. We had Babe Ruth. Um, you know, literally, that you, rep you represented your city. It, yeah. it was about that. It was about your high school. You were pumped up, you know. Hey, man, I was pumped up to wear my, my Menachee gear out, even though people would laugh, you know, Porterville or whatnot. Granted, we have some pretty good players that come out of there. Uh, back in the day but um, you know that's what it was about that's what you played for you played for for where you're from man it wasn't about this organization or or you're playing for some travel guru um, it was about you know the high school the program where you're from man that's that's kind of how I grew up the travel guru mm -hmm. yeah guru that word's thrown around a lot in the <laughs> guru <laughs> There's been some good Twitter beef with uh, some of the hitting guys. Like, uh, was it Swingman or Swingman and, and Mark Kevin Hake? Euclid? Oh yeah, yeah, Euclid and, and Franzen. Franzen. Franzen was on that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, man, don't get me going on today, man. <laughs> You've got a guy that has not had one at bat in his life, and, and I don't even know what level of baseball he's played. But it's not even near the level of baseball that you're talking to two former players that were self-made players. They weren't tooled out individuals. Euclid, I want to say both Euke and Franny were ninth, tenth round picks around there. At that, jeez, dude, they're not going to have to work the rest of their life because they're going to be on MLB pension because they were able to go up there and, and make the most of their ability. Uh, you know, and I don't know if Franny was an all star, but I want to say I think Euke made the all star team a couple years. You know, he was a fixture in that Boston lineup. Um, and that guy knew how to hit, man. Um, to talk to a dude about launch angles, it's all this data guy. I mean, they actually named Saber Metrics after Euclid yeah. with his walks. Yeah, and, he knew how to get know, on base. Yeah, the, the on base percentage. And, you know, um, but those guys, they need to just understand what lane they're in, man. Teach your stuff. Do your thing. You spit some guys out, great. But you're not the guys in the box hitting the baseball, man. And at the end of the day, dude, have some respect. <laughs> just have some yeah. respect you know have some respect for yeah, guys it's that, okay to have a little difference of opinion yeah right? but you're not the end all be there is no end all be all no there's so many different ways to do things i mean you think about it yeah the, i, I want to say there are some absolutes to hitting you know certain things have to happen and, and the barrel has to go certain ways and finish and uh you got to get to it direct all those you know there are some things that have to happen but gosh i played with God, Tony Bautista, man, the way he started, he started with the bat open, the big open stance. But by the time that pitcher came, he was in a good, you know, strong hitting position. So, you know, there's, God, look at was Juan Gonzalez, uh, Julio Franco had that mm -hmm. barrel pointed straight back at the pitcher. Uh, and then all of a sudden he rocks it back. So, but, you know, there's many different ways to do things. It boils down to the athlete, hand-eye coordination, uh, and his ability to put the barrel on the baseball. Yeah. I just, Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk. I mean, I mean, it's just funny, like Euclid and France, and, and I was with the Giants when France was with them, and here's a guy that had to grind 100%. every single day to stay in the big leagues. So you don't think he had to get his swing, right? You know I, what I mean? And even Euclid, everybody looked at him and looked, what is this guy doing? He yes. can't hit. You know, Hands separate and had the little yeah. rock up top, and then you his know, feet like one inch self made players, yeah, self made players. Uh, so it's like, who are you? Like you said, some guy that probably mm -hmm. never even swung a bat before, talking to these guys that had to make it like actually make it, make it. They weren't just first round bonus guys that were like, no. oh, they're gonna get a shot no matter what. They had to hit, yeah, they, they had to hit, they had to hit, they, you're right? They, not in this, you know, let's let's change. Let's they, they, if anybody wants to change anything, let's change what they're calling themselves hitting consultants. You're not teaching hitting, no, you want to talk, hey, you want to call yourself a slugging consultant, a slow pitch softballs consultant, sweet, cool, you're a slugging consultant because a hitting consultant is going to teach you how to hit that pitch down and away and drive it to the right center field not try to lift it out of the ballpark a hitting guy is going to teach you how to get the barrel to the baseball efficiently short and use the whole field from pole to pole and be able to hit the ball on a line you know not sit back and swing and miss swing and miss and then oh we catch one dude that's not hitting no that's slugging 
and that's swinging out your ass. What, can I say that? Swing, say whatever you want. Okay, so that's yep. swinging out your ass. That's not hitting, dude. Um, when we talk hitting, we talk about guys like Edgar Martinez, Manny Ramirez. The dudes knew how to hit, okay? And the power came with the hitting because they knew what to do, knew how to manipulate their swings, how to get to certain pitches, what they were looking for in their approaches. You know, everybody talks about swings. Nobody talks about approach. You know, um, God, you guys got me all fired up now. Bring it. Good. But look, half of being a good hitter is knowing who you are. If you're 140 pounds and you're in the launch angle lane, dude, your your career is going to be short. You know, know who you are. If you're a big, strong, physical cat, hey, man, yeah, let's work on barreling it up. And as we learn how to hit, now let's start tapping into that power. Hey, guess what, dude? We're getting really good to right center. Let's, let's see. Hey, get a little bit more separation on the front side. Let's get a little bit more angle. You're, you're, you're understanding how to hit. Uh, and that's progressing to the power, not just, hey, we're going to do this move, magical moves and hit homers. Dude, it doesn't work that way, man. Everybody's bodies are geared different. Everybody has different lever levers, different strengths. Uh, some guys have hand strength. Some guys have the physical strength to sit back and do that. If you're a short dude that can run, get on base, man. Let the big bopper drive you in. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating to, you know... <clears throat> doing what I do than just going watching guys not understand who they are. Uh, you know, and that's hard to do as a player. Um, and, and I'll be the first to tell you, I mean, I had some home runs at Fresno state that gave me the idea that I had power. That was the last thing I should have been thinking about, you know, and, and that's what got me in trouble later on in the career. You know, you start trying to change gears and hit for power. And next, thing you know, you start sacrificing things, uh, something that you were really good at prior to. Um, so, you know, being a, getting all that power and stuff it comes man and it comes with strength and it comes with age uh but primarily these guys got to know who they're working with and, and what they're what what they're what piece of clay they're playing with man how much mass is there how much strength you know can't keep dude i keep watching dudes teach pot flies all day long i mean we have some really good outfielders running around here before long <laughs> i mean gosh we already got two really good ones over there at buchanan and memorial so uh gosh they're gonna be busy this spring i'll tell you that Man, you got to be honest as a hitter. You know, our, our hitting guy talked to us when we went back to our, our meetings about, you know, our big league guys and, um, you know, the, the self conscious guy or, or the, you know, you got the self awareness guy, the, the guy that's cool with everything, the guy that's self conscious, always worried about everybody else. Um, so it, it's, it's just about getting on the same page, I think. It, it does cause some friction because now, everybody's got to be pulling the same direction man you know so if you're trying to teach a guy how to drive the ball the other way but he's going to sit and talk to a guy that is teaching him how to sit and spin um it's gonna butt heads man um who's wrong who's right you know it goes back to like approach <clears throat> hey man if i'm getting pitched 85 percent of the time on the outside part of the plate why am i gonna look for 15 percent of pitches that you know, i'm not gonna get you know, it's pointless. Like, go to a high school game, watch, actually go scout and watch a high school game. Unless the kid's got a little fuzz on the, on the bump, they're not throwing on the inner third. They're not throwing on the inner third. Hitters end up getting themselves out more times than not in high school with that rollover 6-3, rollover 5-3, rollover, 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 trying to pull outside pitches. Breaking balls. Typically, how many right-handed pitchers are high school, you know, right-handed high school pitchers? Breaking balls away to right-handers. balls. Everything's going the other way from right-handed hitters, man. But they're constantly trying to pull, constantly trying to pull. So, hey, man, dude, you're constantly going to be button heads, in my opinion. To me, man, is I like working with kids that want to be good, <clears throat> kids that want to learn, kids that, that want to be, that want to separate themselves from, from other players, I guess. Not to say, like, oh, my gosh, I'm this great hitting coach, but um, – I just think I, I like working with guys that, that have that have that kind of mindset that I might have had at that age. Um, I didn't have that opportunity. You know, I didn't get hitting lessons growing up, dude. Like, my dad, dude, I grew up on a dairy, man. I grew up and threw rocks and hit them with a, one of those yellow wiffle bats, bro. And I'd piss the milker off because I'd throw the ball off the barn all day long. Filled in, you know, I, I used to fill balls off this, this pavement crap. But I was like Dominican infields. So, hey, man, maybe that's that might have helped the hands a little bit. But, no, um, <clears throat> you know, going back to uh, the lessons, like, you know, I, I, I want to provide them something when they leave that, that they got something out of it, whether it's we talk about approach or, hey, man, we, we, we might have fixed a little 
a load issue that they might have with their hands or it's just about seeing kids progress and get better and, and excel at, at a sport that I love. You know, it's, it's nice to be able to help, help a guy reach that, that, that ability or, uh, have a, had a couple of kids in that past. And it's like, man, I'm not going to go online and tweet about kids I've worked with. Like you look, man, we can show these kids something. We are not the reason why they are good. They are good because they go out and they put hours in the cage. They practice, they work at their craft. And, and for us to sit around and tweet and, and blow ourselves up and pat ourselves on the back, hey, look at my guy, look at my guy. It's not about that, man. Like, dude, you should have enough self-confidence to not have to do that kind of crap. Like, oh, well, you got to go on and tweet about how good you are. Look at me. Look at what I did with this kid. No, hey, man, you showed him some things. He bought into a couple nuggets and he's applying and it's working for him. Dude, hey, kudos to the kid, man. Yeah. Kudos to the kid, not you, not you, Johnny hitting coach or Billy hitting or whatever, whoever you are like, just, Hey man, give, let's start giving these kids some credit for the work they're putting in. You know, it's, if I got to read another, I'm blessed to announce thing. I mean, I think it's great for these kids and cool, but at the end of the day, like, come on, man, like, dude, you're going to South Dakota state emperors. Awesome. Awesome. The whole world doesn't need to know. Cool. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of that stuff. Like that's now a, the I'm not a, guys are I'm not a taster it. guy. I don't like guys that are tasters. I like tasting themselves, man. Like, dude, get over it. Constantly retweeting about themselves, dude. Turn the page. Let's go. Does it make the job hard sometimes? Because you have to go look at certain guys and it definitely guys are doing can become that. a turn off. It, it really can, man. It, it can, especially if they're tweeting but about. They could be warning signs, right? Yeah, I mean, we're looking for substance, guys. <clears throat> People forget that when we go out and scout, we're not looking for guys to play pro ball. We're looking for big leaguers, dude. We're looking for guys that act like big leaguers, carry themselves like big leaguers, train like big leaguers, think like big leaguers. Not guys that are carried about the the, the fluff, the social, the the the, the spotlight stuff. We care. We want guys that have substance, like ball players, gritty, tough. You know, the professionals, Derek Jeter's man. You think Derek Jeter runs around? He, that guy didn't run around. No, like you never saw anything. You know, we're like, no, no, you know, still don't. No, no. I mean, those look guys with exceptional makeup, man. They're not tweeting, retweeting like stupid crap or, uh, yeah. You know, kids just don't understand that, man. They're, they're being followed and watched 24 7, 24 7. One retweet just might sour somebody's taste, man. And when a lot of them want, you know, they want to be. Everybody followed. wants the blue check mark, man. And they wanna they wanna be seen too. Everybody wants the blue check mark. Everybody wants that fame. It's you know, we wanna microwave our way to to stardom. Let's let's nuke it, man. That's what we're trying to do with these players too. These guys are look at the velocity, man. We're trying to definitely microwave velocity. Yeah. Uh, these throwing programs and guys are sprinting and throwing as hard as they can. Like somebody's going to get keep guys are gonna keep blowing out, man. Uh, and TJ and Guys are now. I mean, what are we going to talk about? The guys getting moved up a year or two, or holding themselves back a year to be a year older. I mean, that was next on my yeah, list. You know, we can get because this is that was a new thing. I hadn't heard. I mean, honestly, I'm and it would no, bubble. It's been going on. We're in a bubble out here, was, right? We don't, we don't. We deal with transfers, like yeah. kids leaving. Yeah, and but, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. No, but seeing kids don't know that's a turn off to us too. We don't want some dudes that transferred two or three, four different schools. That that's a little nerve wracking. Like, why is there? Why do you keep transferring? What is wrong where you're at that you got to keep transferring? Yeah. Or, you know, getting into the, you know, nineteen year old senior, it's it's a turn off for us as well from a pro game. Yeah, like, that's the first I'd heard of, of that going on, and 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 then apparently it's been a thing. Yeah, like we said, seventeen year old senior, nineteen year old senior, the both same tools, exactly the same, same tools. Who you drafted? Seventeen year old all day long. Yeah, I mean. More upside, youthful, uh, you know, granted, depending on the body and how it looks and stuff. I mean, if the 19-year-old still has some projection left, hey, why not? But, man, we're obviously looking for the younger cast. Just look at all the Latin kids we signed. The international market. It's all young, young kids. Um, so the younger, the better, honestly, for us. Um, I get it from a college pr perspective. Yeah, hey, you're getting that extra year of maturity, um, physicality. That's great. Uh, you are draft eligible as a sophomore, which hey, that's you're not skipping a beat there uh, per se. Hey, uh, well, Quentin Selma was is older. He he was draft eligible as a sophomore. And we've had multiple kids that were, um, but at 19 year old senior, dude, you better. When I show up to the park, dude, you need to dominate. Like you need to hit, like and hit, and thump. Uh, and if you're a pitcher, you better have some stuff, man. Like I'm, it'd be hard to show up for 86, 88 if you're 19, dude. Like. I get it if you're 17, but 19, uh, you know, from a college stand standpoint, yeah, you know, 
and obviously it's going to help with the maturity. Just the kid's going to be older, um, have a little wiser head on his shoulders. But um, from a professional standpoint, I mean, I would kind of discourage that. I, I'm, I'm trying to get the concept of it. Is is it to <clears throat> help their high school team win? I don't understand. What's you know? I don't. I don't know. I don't. What's the point? You're I, staying I an extra know. year to help your high school cl- club, or well, like you said, you, you maybe be, you put up more numbers and you get a, technically an offer. A freshman in college plays senior year of high school. Yeah, you're yeah, like a freshman so. playing against. Uh, you know, it's like uh, we get the the D1 kickbacks to the JUCOs. Those are kind of turnoffs too. I mean, why couldn't you play at the D1? You know, I mean, but nobody ever asked that question. It's like all of a sudden a guy goes back to junior college and he's a prospect all of a sudden. How so? You know, I get it from a, hey, pitchers are totally different animals. Uh, but a position player, if you're at a D1 and you're kicking back, that's kind of red flag. It, it, it is. Um, you know, and granted, there are some, there are the rare occasions where it is a conflict of interest between player coach. But 95% of the time, you just weren't ready. One, you weren't ready for that level. And, and two, you couldn't pro- handle yeah, it. you just weren't ready for that level. Uh, not to say you're not good enough yet, um, but maybe that might have been a little bigger jump than the ability was yeah. was ready for. Um, but, um, you know, but being a 19-year-old senior dude, like, you better really do something when a pro guy shows up to the park. Um, you know, um, not a big fan of transfers and kickbacks. And it, it's hard when you get into our game um, with the pro side. A little different from the college. Hey, man, it's college. It's different. We're not giving, they're not giving them two million bucks. Or eight hundred grand. Right. I mean, I got a report. I got four million dollars on a eighteen-year-old high school kid, dude. You know, um, people don't understand that, man. That's a lot of money. You're banking that that guy becomes the Mike Trout or uh, uh, Mookie uh, Carlos Betts. Correa. You know, Mookie Betts was a fifth rounder, dude. Like to get Mookie Betts in the fifth round is an unbelievable pick. Paul Goldschmidt, like ninth rounder, like. I mean, come on, man. Those are the dudes that you, as a scout, those are the guys you make your name on. It's not the first rounder. It's the. Yeah, because everybody's going after those guys. Yeah, They're all competing for the same crop. Yes. It's that later round. The Doug Fister, fifth round. You know, guy pitching the big leagues, eight, what, 10 years? 10, one years. You yeah. know, um, those are the dudes that, that, that an area scout will get some kudos for or get some love. Kind of what's your checklist? You don't have to give us the, you know, your, your details, not the super inside info, but like when you get to a ballpark, What's the first thing that you're looking for when you're, you know, you see, you know, you're going to see a couple kids. Let's do high school. Yeah. High school <laughs> games. Yeah. High school is a little different. Um, I mean, leave early. I mean, you got to get there early. Uh, sometimes that GPS can, can get you a little uh, whacked out and end up in some uh, unfamiliar and uh, not so friendly territories. Uh, up there, you get in some, some regions. Uh, but try to leave early, man. Get to the park early. Get some familiarity with it. Like, I try to like, I don't like to be seen so much all the time. Um, if I got to watch a pitcher, it's one thing because you got to get behind the dish. But if I'm watching a position player, man, I, I typically don't like sitting in the stands. I like to get down the line. Um, occasionally, I'll just go out behind center field and I'll watch from right behind shortstop, man. Um, watch him hit. Um, and I, I, I like to maneuver my way around the yard, man. I like to see who gets there early. Um, if there's anybody in the cages, if maybe a kid might be getting some early work around balls, um, see if my prospect shows up early or if he, or if he's the guy running in two minutes before a stretch, putting his spikes on with half his Jersey hanging out, you know, hat on crooked. Like that's not something to, <laughs> that Tom Kochman's going to like an a ball. Um, so, you know, you, you try to get there early. Um, watch them go through a, a routine if they have one. It, it's nice to see high school players have a routine, um, whether it's, you know, it might be how they put their shoes on and go out and they do certain stretches. They do their little warm-ups, you know, watch them go through a, a routine um, and just kind of watch them kind of prepare, see how they interact with their teammates, um, coaches, uh, see if they're, you know, maybe if I catch them on the road, see if he's trying to see anything about the ballpark that might be different um that that might affect where he plays maybe it's a shortstop with limited foul territory down the third baseline you know walk it off see how many steps he has or whatnot or if it's a catcher kind of throw a couple balls off the backstop see what kind of bounce he's going to get just look for little things that might separate a player from the other guys you know and uh, a lot of times dude it when you get into double a man everybody has those tools everybody does but it's those little separators those little things that puts 
chat over Jake. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, it, in a it, majority of the time, it boils back down to makeup, man. Like, who's willing to go the extra mile? Who's willing to put it in, or or who's willing to get there and prepare? You know, who's willing to take that extra step and you get there a half hour early instead of you know ten minutes before stretch? So, you know, looking for little things a guy might do that stand out, separate himself. And then obviously the games take care of itself. Uh, and I'm not a performance guy, dude. Like, man, they had a kid down at Bakersfield a couple years ago. I love this kid. I uh, had little King Griffey Jr. He's at Cal State now. He's a freshman kid named Jason Roberson. Having a good little good little start to his freshman year. Um, but, man, I saw that kid three times, dude. And I stuffed him. He didn't get one hit. And the three times I saw him, he was 0 for 11. And I stuffed him. I put 800 grand on him. Like, Why? Because he didn't have to perform. The tools are there. The tools are there that, that fit that category to profile there. And, you know, and um, guys don't have to perform all the time. You know, um, it's nice to go to the yard and see a dude you're watching as a hitter, especially if you got your boss with you, get a couple knocks and smoke a couple balls. Or if it's a pitcher, you know, light the gun up a little bit, flash you a breaking ball that's got some bite, you know, maybe sell the change that, that gives him something to say, ooh, this guy, hey, man, I get what Labby's talking about. Um, but sometimes, man, you just go in and, and guys have a look. Guys have a, a presence. Um, a way they carry themselves, the way they look at you, the way they shake their your hands. Sometimes you're like, dude, this guy's a dude. Like Nick Madrigal is like that. Like you'll watch, he'll be debuting. Like if guys, you know, going back to the hitting coaches and stuff. If guys want to be hitters, dude, to tail yourself in high school, be like Nick Madrigal. Be Nick Madrigal in high school. And I can't talk about this dude yet, but I will one day. Um, but be Nick Madrigal. That dude was a stud high school hitter. He didn't hit a lot of home runs, but that dude barreled up things. Everybody just barrel, barrel, barrel. Like, be Nick Madrigal, man. Wear out the middle of the diamond. Just create havoc. Put the ball in play. You know, those are the kind of dudes, like, you should tell yourself, tail your, tailor your game after. Um, not like some dude that's hitting 45 pumps in the big leagues and you have one career home run i mean <laughs> that's just not realistic dude not, be you. realistic with who you are but uh well you know, he's he's done well in college he did well mm -hmm. at oregon state his, at, in pro ball last year didn't he strike out less than 10 yeah, times and he had yeah, a great guy struck out i think he had <clears> three almost or four. 600 at bats i mean we can look it up but i think he struck out 15 times in 500 at bats it was like some absurd Stupid. absurd Tony Gwynn type rate stuff. yeah and um, dude, I remember him answering the door for me one day, <laughs> dude. And I, I just like, I just like folded because he was standing there. This guy was a rail, like maybe 150 pounds, dude, wet. And he had this little dry fit on it. it had to, it was probably a medium. It looked like an extra large just draped on him. And I'm like, dude, I have, I have, I have way too much money on this little guy. Like, I, I just couldn't get over how tiny he was. But then you go and watch him and you're like, Dude, this guy is a stud. Plays 6'2", yeah. 215 you pounds. Know, if, if that dude's six foot one, he's the first pick. Like, slam dunk, D Brown, boom, slam at home. First pick if he's 6'1". It's just unfortunate. It's unfortunate our game. We do that at times. But um, that guy was almost a red stock, and you can sit around and talk about almost and shoulda, coulda, wouldas. But that guy was almost my first pick, my first sign. Uh, but, you know, it boils back down to... These kids, you get the signability, man, and um, you start finding out who really wants to go out and play right away. Um, you know, taking Carson last year, that you know that that was a kid that wanted to go out and play, um, and that was a it was even pretty special. You know, it's Billy's son. Uh, you know, you know the bloodlines are there, the genes are there, and you talk about a guy that had like the intangible things. That was one of the things that that really attracted me to him was. Was dude, the guy was on. He was on top of what he wanted to do. He 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 knew what direction he wanted to go in. And he put in the work. Like and um, you know, there's a lot of players out there, man. They're, you know, and that's why junior college is such a a great place for some of those guys rather than going to off to these 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 smaller schools. You know, and the guy want to go to D two or D three. That's cool, but honestly, that tells me he doesn't want to be a big leaguer. I mean, it really does. It, like. <laughs> Nothing against some of the local schools, but dude, there's not a lot of those guys when they're announcing them in the big leagues that came from D2, NAIA, D3s, uh, any you know, D4s. It, there's just not. Uh, you know, I got to scout the the places where they're at, and when a kid's more willing and and really pumped up to go to one of those places, it I don't know, man, it kind of red flag for me again too. 
Because uh, if you're a dude that wants to play bro ball, you're going to go to JUCO for two years, man. You're going to give me two opportunities, two more years to come watch you play. And maybe after your sophomore year, you've put on a few more pounds. Maybe you've taken enough ground balls in the six hole that arm started to get strong enough to where I, we can send you out as a shortstop. Um, you know, junior college is such a great place for these dudes. And and I don't know why it's become such a bad stigma. It's it's like a, a slap in the face to go to junior college. It, we're better crazy. Than, you know, we're better than junior college. But you look at it, but they would rather go to a small school and, write, and set the bench and sit behind some junior that came from a junior college, by the way, that's starting over them. You know, I, it blows my mind. Um, those schools are going to be there with open arms, pumped up. They're they're giving you school money to come there if you've gone to junior college for two years and proven yourself. Not to mention the Division ones uh, might not be a California D1. Those Northeast schools are always looking for yeah. California junior college players. Um, the Southeast uh santa rosa is always sending dudes out delta city cos really sending guy i mean dude if you want it if and if you really want to be a d1 player then you challenge yourself you go to you go to jc you know and i'll be the first to tell you dude, i was a juco product you were a juco product uh if i had not gone to cos i promise you if you I'd told gone, us that dude if i'd have gone straight to fresno state i would not have lost it uh, junior college was the best move, and and for ninety five percent of these kids, it's the best move. But you know Dylan, what? Dylan said the same thing. Dylan Lee, Dylan Lee, hundred percent, man. He wasn't ready to go to straight to school, uh, straight to a four year. You know, the breaking ball needed to get a little bit better, and he needed to mature. I think Connor mentioned the same thing, and all those. I guys. mean, it's it's funny that we talk about it when this whole everybody's D one or bust nowadays, oh, but then crazy. they don't get the D one. Now they're going to a D2 or D3. Yeah. So if you're D1 or bust, to me, that's yes. that's how we were. We were D1 or bust technically, but our way to get to a D1 went through GQ, COS and 100%. Fresno City College. What I because love, I wasn't going to settle for anything less until that was my last option. Absolutely. I love what uh, Solberg said, too, regarding just, you know, the price of going to JUCO as a scholarship. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, I thought that made great sense. I never looked at it that way. And it's so true. Because your first two years, you're doing your GED anyways, yeah. no matter where you go. Well, go back and look at it. So most of it, if you if, if want to get back to like and say, okay, this is probably the reason why is you look at all these people, they do all this travel ball. These kids are, they're pumping money mm -hmm. into this travel, pump, pump, pump. Well, that's the only thing that comes about it. So now we've just spent $10,000, $12,000 this summer on little Mikey to travel around so he could get a scholarship. Well, he doesn't get one. So or he does to like all of a sudden yes yeah. here comes the travel ball guy oh, i found your kid a home a great fit it's a great fit for him yeah because there it's not the skill level that you know that's why he fits there just go to the junior college go for two years but now it's like oh man we just wasted all that money this summer so they jump on this this four-year school like it's the fit like that's where it's supposed to be and it's probably the only school that's a recruiter them so now they're even a little bit happier. Uh, they get a little warm and fuzzy, and now they commit. And, man, at the end of the day, they look at that junior college, and, dude, they're going to save money. They're going to play more innings. They're going to have a lot better opportunity to get on the field right away. Um, and and around here, dude, we have – kids are driving past local JUCOs to go to these these smaller schools that have reputable coaches with long standing resumes to go to these smaller schools. It just blows my mind, man. It, it really does, you know. Well, if you throw that process back, right, you start at 9, 10 years old until you're 18. How much money in the eight years do you spend on travel ball, lessons, you, tons? And then, oh, I didn't get a scholarship. Now I got to fork out twenty five grand. Or you don't get a full ride scholarship, and everybody thinks they're getting this full ride. Well, hey, it costs sixty grand to go to Santa Clara, so I get twenty five percent. So I'm getting fifteen, right? I think I did the math. <laughs> I still got to come up with twenty five twenty five grand to go to Santa Clara, but I'm on scholarship. Not to mention the money I dropped in the process to get the mm -hmm. scholarship, which I probably would have gotten the offer anyways had I not done the twelve thousand dollars scholarship because I have the ability. Um, so it just, man, it's, it's kind of vicious little circle, uh, and everybody gets caught up in this game, man. And it's, it's game and it's just garbage that comes out of these dudes mouths, man. And it, it it's, it's unfortunate because the long list and of emails and, uh, it's almost like car sales, you know, it's like, bit. how good is an organization when they have eight teams at the same level? 
eight teams are all 16 to 18. They're all the same age. Like, how good is that organization? How good is that team? So now you have your red, blue, yellow, turquoise, pink, teal. Well, who's really magenta. getting the love, too? Yeah, like, who, you got, you know. Now you're you, absolutely, you're favoring somebody. You, yeah, you have your elite team. Yeah, well, yeah. now you have your other six teams that are pissed off that they're not on the elite team. And, dude, it's a joke, man. I mean, it really is. Uh, so, you know, save your money. Go to junior college. <laughs> Well, even uh, that, these kids that are going to Division twos, Division II, NAIs for scholarships, they have good grades. A lot of the yeah. JUCOs are, like me, I was going to a junior college anyways, just grade-wise. But now, with the way high school is and everybody's graduating and being able to have good grades, you could be there for a year. You don't have to be a JUCO for two years no, now if you have if the you're grades. If you're a qualifier, you can transfer <clears> out. And, you know, you know, I speak just because I coach with Coach Purse, but... You know, that dude's got connections. That guy's a very well-respected coach. If he calls a guy and says, hey, uh, hooky, P here, uh, dude, I got a, I got a freshman. This is a kid that you're probably going to want to jump on that that you're going to want to get. He's he going to be ready for you as a sophomore. Hooky's going to come see that dude. You know, and it boils back down to skill level. Have, have some – be realistic about your skill level. Uh, you know, a lot of times I go watch pitchers and – you know, you, you talk to the dad, and he's talking, oh, man, you know, he's been throwing, he's up to, eight, up to 90. Okay, well, that's not going to pitch in the SEC. Your son told me he wants to go to Alabama. That's not good enough for Alabama. So, you know, you got to reroute, be realistic. Hey, that might be more of Cal State Bakersfield or, uh, you know, a, a smaller school, maybe not of the SEC caliber. Set your sights for something that's attainable. Uh, and then don't be let down when, oh, man, I didn't get to go to Vanderbilt. Well, dude, you're throwing 84 miles an hour. You yeah, know, or go to a JUCO and develop one more year or two more years. Exactly. And, and, and then try to go there again. And if not, then those other schools are there. Give yourself that opportunity, man. Put yourself out there. Put yourself on a limb. See, but the problem with that is it boils down to them now. They don't want to put the work in because so, so many of these kids are so relied upon. Well, I'm part of this organization. Look at me. I'm a, I'm a so-so guy. Or I don't want to say any names because then I get people all upset. But, you know, they think that they're good because of what they wear or what jersey you put on, man. That doesn't that doesn't entitle you to a scholarship because you you pay twelve hundred bucks a month to belong to this organization. That's not what it's about. Like you have to have the skill level, man. I mean, it just I, I it drives me crazy, man. You're in, you're out. Like I hear it day in, day out, go to the park and. It's the same story. We heard one the other day. You know, my he, he hasn't adjusted to the 80-mile-an-hour pitching yet. Look, dude, your son's a hitter, man. All I know is hitters hit. I don't care if it's 88, 78, 58, 38, 98. If a dude can hit, he's going to hit. It's not this. That's just making an excuse. Those dudes I run from, like those guys scared me to death. People that promise me things and people that make excuses like that I run from. Like, you know... Don't promise me anything. You know, back in the day when I signed that agent, promise me I'll have you in double A. You signed with me. I, I promise. I guarantee you'll be in double A next year. So I just flipped it on him. I said, well, what if I go out and I hit a buck 80? It got dead silent. Oh, well, while I still not being, well, I still be in double A. Well, well, you know, you're going to have to. Okay. So don't guarantee me nothing because you can't promise me that. Like run from people that do that. Kids, if people promise you things that guarantee you that run, like get away, go away. Nobody can guarantee you that. Oh, I promise you, you'll this. Well, that guy's probably lying to you. So just be careful, like tread lightly. Uh, no, we'll be good. seeing you around here. At Easter classic too. Dan, that's another great tournament, man. I mean, we've got the Boris going on and, and there's another tournament up in St. Francis, Francis area, but um, I mean, you can plan on, dude, you're going to see a lot of scouts down here. Pappy did a good job this year. They've got some good teams in and, uh, they're not to mention good teams, but I mean, you're going to see a lot of pro guys running around. There's a lot of prospects, dude. Uh, you know, Oakmont's coming down. They'll have that kid. He might be on there throwing hundred and miles an hour. Yeah. Pappy, uh -oh. you did it. You did a great job. <laughs> Is he watching live or he, something? No, 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 but, but he, uh, he'll get it. <laughs> he'll he get will. it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, dude. He, they all do a fantastic job. Yeah. Pappy, dude, this dinner's classic i mean it's gonna be uh it'll be a little di bit different without sam and, yeah. and sam's jokes uh and sam's jokes were always and classic James. because he's busting pappy's balls and yep. god if anybody needs his balls busted it's pappy <laughs> i mean you know <laughs> That's dude, i love that guy man we love busting his balls he's, he's, he's and james james, wow, always, james was good for uh, 
Coach J- P? James Patch was always good I'm for... I'm sure Coach P is going to make a comment. He's going to make a celebrity appearance. I know? hope so. I miss um, that guy. Don't get me started talking about him, too, because, man, you talk about legendary coaches, dude. Okay, just real quick before I get out of here. <laughs> but if people want to put that man's coaching career, you know, nobody... That dude, when you say legend, that's capital letters yeah. all the way across. Yeah. You know, coach, what, 32, 33 seasons? 32. 32 seasons, okay? You get a plaque. You get a plaque for winning, winning the Valley or runner-up, okay? That little shed right behind first base dugout has 15 plaques. You know, you start doing the math. That guy is playing for a title every other year, you know, and then he's winning one every fourth year. You know, that's that's a program. <clears throat> that That's that's winning and that's reg- dude that guy was winning with whether he had five division one commits a pro prospect or he was winning Absolutely. with not a single division one player that is man to what he did like you know like i have a lot of respect for coach patrick and and i'm not the only one i mean just statewide what that dude is, did during his career uh on the baseball diamond with those players is i mean dude that's a, that's legend man True I've, legend. i haven't met a person that knows him I haven't met anybody that's not enjoyed being around him either. No, man. It does not like that guy. And if you have the opportunity to get to coach with that guy, he is special on the diamond, man. He's out there doing drills with the players and he's interacting. And I mean, his energy level can meet and match and, and, and peak his players. I mean, and that's what makes him so special is that the, the man just has passion for kids and, and watching kids. One of his get players better. wanted to win for him. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's when you know you're, you, dude, that's when you're a legend. When you, when your players do just like mesmerize and do, we've got to win for coach, you know, and uh, coach P man, like, legend dude i'll keep saying it but that's what he does uh and he did for years and kudos man hat off to that guy. yeah enjoy the retirement no doubt well dude i appreciate you believe it i do time. need to yeah, yeah go. he's got to go you got to get Good games to watch but uh the ballpark we'll be doing another update this week and uh that's episode uh 42 42 josh labandera oh hit or die <laughs>